Hey, everyone, and welcome to the All It Takes is Gold podcast, the best place in the entire world, including all of Canada, to learn how to build new thoughts, new actions, and new results. I'm your host, John Acuff, and today I'm joined by Julie Solomon. Who's that? I'm so glad you asked. Julie Solomon is a business coach, speaker, and host of the top rated The Influencer Podcast. And she's also the author of the upcoming book, Get What You Want, How to Go from Unseen to Unstoppable. HarperCollins Leadership is publishing that one. Julie spent over a decade helping people align their purpose with their vision to find out what makes them shine while confidently sharing it with the world. And what's really fun is she lives in Nashville just like I do. And we have a lot of mutual friends. We both know Lewis Howes and Rory and AJ Vaden. And so it was really fun to go, oh, wait a second. We know a lot of the same people. And the conversation was a blast. The book is really authentic, but also really practical, which is a great mix where it's real stories, real challenges, but also real actions you can take to change what you're doing. So I can't wait for you to hear this episode. But first, a quick message about the sponsor of today's episode. Today's sponsor is me. I've been really surprised at how many people who listen to this podcast have reached out to me about having me speak at their events. I love that. And here's why. Over the last 13 years, I've had the honor to help hundreds of companies like Nissan, Walmart, Microsoft, and Comedy Central at events around the world. And during that time, I've developed three big goals for your event. Number one, I want to slingshot your audience into the best year they've ever had. Whether I'm opening, closing, or somewhere in the middle of the event, I want to launch everyone out of that room with actionable, memorable things that they can apply to their work and lives immediately. Number two, my second goal, I want the sound team engaged and laughing. The sound team has heard it all. They have. And if I can make them laugh and learn along the way, the audience is going to absolutely love the keynote. And number three, my third goal, I want you to get text messages during the keynote. My favorite sentence to hear from you after I speak is, John, my phone was blowing up during your keynote. I'm there to make you look like a rock star, not me. If your boss texts you during my speech and compliments you on how well the event is going, then I know I've done my job. Whether it's virtual or live, 10,000 people in an arena or 15 sales team members on WebEx or Zoom or, or Microsoft Teams, I'd love to help you with your next event. Fill out the quick form at acuff.me slash speaking to check my availability. That's acuff, A-C-U-F-F dot M-E slash speaking. All right, let's jump into my interview with Julie Solomon. All right, Julie, first question, which you probably don't get on a lot of these interviews because I know you're doing a ton of them in support of your new book. Where did you go to high school? I went to Brentwood High School in Brentwood, Tennessee. I thought that was going to be the answer because I live in Franklin, Tennessee. Right. I mean, we hate Brentwood. You know, like right. we're, They're kind of our rivals. Right. But when you told the story about getting rejected from the school you wanted to go, so your entire class minus two people, one of them, 50% of them named Julie, <laughs> the other girl, I don't really, we're not even talking about her. Right. Um, that was such a tough story. And I think there's a lot of really honest stories in this book. Was that a goal from the outset that you said, okay, a lot of these types of books, it's all home runs. It's like, here's the thousand amazing things I've done and nothing bad has ever happened. Mm -hmm. And I felt like you really leaned into this authenticity. Was that something you wanted from the get go? Yeah. You know, John, I've always, for one, as a reader myself, I tend to connect most to the books that surprise me a little bit that share a little bit more, especially, you know, nonfiction books. I, I learn, I, I learn more about the author than I thought I was going to. Thus, it also makes me closing that last page feeling not only motivated, but it actually mm-hmm. leaves me feeling with more love, compassion, and respect for myself. Mm-hmm. And so I knew that if I was ever given the gift to write a book and have people actually read the dang thing, no less, that I wanted to be able to do that. And I tend to be a little bit more of a vault on social media because, you know, I'm I'm a business coach. I help people build mm-hmm. brands. I help people lock in, you know, their influence, which is their superpower. And so I, I tend to have a lot of that, like, let's, you know, get down and get 
down to the business and to the work and mm-hmm. and lock in what's best and and don't tend to share as much of my my personal life in those vulnerable moments. So I was really excited to have this space in these pages to be able to do that. Yeah, and I, I was so pleased that you fulfilled that right out of the gate because you mentioned that you had been disappointed by another book by a hero of yours mm-hmm. and said, okay, I'm going to do the opposite. Um, and I was kind of like, okay, well, let's see if she does the opposite. And you immediately did. Like yeah. you immediately paid it off. The book kicks off with a story about your husband calling you and saying, hey, when are you going to tell me about this $30,000 in credit card debt? And you can just feel the tension of that moment. Can you explain a little bit about that story, what that kicked off, how you worked on it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that story, it, it leads, I, I lead the book with, you know, a call from my husband saying, you know, hey, hon, when were you going to tell me about the credit card? And what he was talking about was that I had been hiding and amassing um, tens of thousands of dollars, over $30,000 of credit card debt and had been keeping it from him. And this is a credit card that had his name on it along with my name on it. And mm-hmm. here I was, you know, at my kitchen, at my, you know, kitchen table having to deal with this truth. And I think to really understand, um, I mean, obviously that's just so shocking because I'm, I'm caught in a lie. I'm caught lying to someone that means the world to me. And I'm caught now having to face some really hard truths about myself. And that hard truth was, why am I so freaking afraid to be honest, especially when it comes to money? Mm -hmm. And in order to really understand that, in order for me to really understand that, I had to go all the way back to what I call in the book, there's a whole chapter on it, um, my origin story. I define an origin story and you hear about them. And, you know, if you watch any kind of Marvel or DC comic Mm -hmm. movie, it's, it's the story that really shapes our hero's journey. You know, it's kind of the, the, the rags to riches or, or even in that mindset of, you know, this, this is the thought, the belief pattern, the institution, the idea that made me the way that I am. And so I had to go back to a really, really dark origin story that I had, which was around this scarcity mindset. I'm originally from a small town called McMinnville, Tennessee. Um, sure. I grew up in a very, yeah, you you know, you're familiar. I grew up in a very working class family. My dad literally wore a blue collar to work every day. He worked the night shift at Nissan, uh, which is an auto plant. He would drive from McMinnville, Tennessee to Murfreesboro, Tennessee every single night with a case of beer in his uh, in the back of his truck going to work. And there was a lot of just scarcity in in that small town mindset. So I was dealt with, you know, there's never enough money. And if there is enough Mm -hmm. money, we're just getting by. Will we get by? Do we have enough? And so topics about savings were never discussed because there was no money to save. Um, Financial independence, uh, financial advising, 401ks, Mm -hmm. college funds, none of that was part of my reality at, at a really young age. Um, And I also come from this origin story um, that tends to be common in in the South. And it also tends to be common, I think, with the baby boomer generation of, you know, Julie, some fairy, you know, godfather is going to fall down from the sky and take care of money for you. You're a woman, so you don't need to worry about this. And not not only do you not need to worry about this, but we kind of don't want you to worry about this because you're a woman, which makes you automatically a financial or, you know, a financial toddler. And Mm -hmm. so you're not good at math. You're not good at numbers. You know, you can like have a job because it's cute and you can have your play money, but let the real people come in and deal with the checking accounts and the savings accounts and all of that Mm -hmm. because you're not going to be able to handle that. So that was the belief system that I had for a very long time. And so it allowed me to stick my head in the sand for a really long time. It allowed me to not take ownership and accountability for not only understanding money, but even being able to value and feel worthy of the money that I was making. John, I'm savvy, I'm smart as a whip, and I'm really good at what I do. So I can make a lot of money, Mm -hmm. but I would spend it faster than I could even uh, okay. speak it. And now, since I coach a lot of women through this, I find, and you may find it too, John, that women tend to do one of two things. They'll make money and then it's kind of like they'll they'll take it and they'll metaphorically stick it under their bed in the shoebox and they'll never touch it. Like they don't mm-hmm. want to invest. You know, they're so afraid of losing it. Or they're like me, they'll make it. They don't really know what to do with it. They don't feel worthy of what they've made. So they spend it faster than they can make it. And 
that compounded with, I had moved to Los Angeles. So I was in a brand new city. I didn't know anybody. I was a brand new mom for the first time. Mm -hmm. All of this compounded to me feeling this kind of fresh validation to spending money. And I was making money for the first time and it felt good. And to be able to have the quote unquote delusional freedom that I had to be able to spend the money on whatever I Mm -hmm. wanted to. Because when I was little, I never had that gift to be able to do that. And so all of those little puzzle pieces then formed together to put me in that moment, sitting at the kitchen table with my husband calling me and me having to start facing these harsh realities that I had around scarcity, abundance, validation, worthiness, and money. What year was this? This was twenty early 2015. Early 2015. Okay. And I think you're, I think you're right. There's a lot of, I think there's a lot of broken mindsets around, um, around money, around gender and money. There's, there's so many kind of booby traps, um, with that. What would you say to somebody that would say, okay, Julie, I, I resonate with a lot of that. I self-sabotage. Maybe that's their money thing. They, they get the money, they self-sabotage by either overspending or drilling holes in their own boat before it gets back to the harbor. Cause they grew up with this idea that success is bad. Cause I think I, you know, I live in the South now and I've, I've spent the majority of my life in the South. And I would say there's some of that too, of you don't want to be a show off. You don't want to, and Nashville has that obviously way more than LA. Like you've, been, you've lived in both cultures. LA is not afraid to show off. Like Nashville has some of that where it's, well, you know, don't get too big for your britches. So if I was a listener and said, wow, Julie, I resonate with that. My thing is, I don't deserve success. Success is a bad thing. Success is showing off. How do you help that person? Yeah, well, first, it's it's about getting really honest about what I think success and making money is, which is just an exchange of energy. And it's really coming from the service-based place. So first of, you know, why do you want to be successful? What yeah. is what is the deeper core reason behind that? Um good or bad, you know? And, and for me, it was that at, at that time, I didn't really have a purpose that was outside of myself. I wanted to be ex- successful so I could prove to myself that I could make money because I was raised in a family that couldn't make a lot of money. So it was mm-hmm. this very achievement-based relentlessness that had gotten me there, which can serve you to a certain degree. Yeah, eventually it takes more than it gives, but it, it'll get you through some things. It, yeah, it will allow you to kind of white knuckle yourself through mm-hmm. some things, but it will serve you until it doesn't. And then when it doesn't, you have to start asking yourself simple questions. But for me, at least at the time, they were very hard questions to ask, which was, you know, why do I want to create an impact? Who am I creating it for? Do I feel worthy enough to be able to create an impact? Do I feel worthy to share my voice? Why am I so afraid to be seen? Why do I keep hiding myself and expecting to be seen? That's mm-hmm. a huge one that I see. Yeah. You know, there's this expectation of why am I not growing? Why, you know, why am I not making the money? Why am I not getting the partner? Why am I not getting the dream house, the beach house? But then they're over in the corner hiding in, you mm-hmm. know, a lot of many different ways. And, and, and so it's that expectation that then just leads to a resentment that compounds on top of each other. And so that was the big thing for me is getting really clear about my why, you know, why, why does this matter to me? And and what kind of impact do I want to make? And I now have a family that I'm building and that I'm growing and I'm no longer this, you know, child living in McMinnville, Tennessee, that's, you know, leaning on her, her origin story. I'm now a freaking, you know, grown adult woman that needs to start taking stock and accountability for what she is choosing to believe. Was it hard? And, and the reason I ask is I love how Gay Hendricks addresses this um, in The Big Leap, which mm-hmm. I'm sure you've read yeah. um, about sometimes we pull back because we're afraid to outshine somebody else. It can be a brother, a spouse, a husband, a parent, a mother, a dad, or we're afraid to be disloyal to our, our upbringing. That if we get successful with disloyal to McMinnville or insert your name of the town here, was it hard for remaining family members like, was that a tension for you that you start to have this growth and this success and it's public and it's working? Was that part of the challenge too? I would say that that wasn't part of the challenge for me just because what I started to unlock was a possibility that I don't think a lot of people in my family before me even knew was possible. You know, my grandmother never saw the ocean with her own two eyes before she passed away. Like, you know, my 
dad literally grew up in a trailer. So it's like Mm -hmm. the expansiveness was so large. Mm -hmm. But I think to me, what was the upper limit in the self-sabotage was who am I to think that I can have this because they didn't have it. So it was kind of going back to what you were saying of like, I had to be loyal to that origin story, which was for Mm -hmm. me that success had to be a struggle and getting what you want had to be a struggle and it can't be easy and you've got a claw and you know, just. It can't be fun. It can't be joyful. No, yeah, it can't be. It's gotta be hard and scarce. And if, and if it's not hard, then you're doing it wrong. And so I would make things way more complicated than it needed to be. I would self-sabotage. I would overspend or I would, you know, waste a lot of money. You know, I would hire a bunch of people without even knowing how to hire in the first place or who I needed to support, you know, a lot of things like that in my state of, I think, ignorance and delusion at the time, I would say, but I'm trying to grow. I'm trying to do this. I'm trying to do that. And then I've got my Mm -hmm. husband over here looking at me like, is she insane? Like, Mm -hmm. have I, like, do I know who I've married? And it, it was a, it was a rock bottom moment that I had to go through in order to start really unlocking what those self-sabotaging moments were and to really start to, instead of thinking, you know, I have to live by this belief system, it's that, you know, I'm now given this gift to have a life that, you know, my own parents could have never imagined. Mm -hmm. So how do I not waste that? Yeah. How do you steward it? How do you steward that opportunity? I'm curious who helped like in this moment or in the, you know, the, the time that you kind of really started to look at this for the first time, who helps you walk through that? Who helps you process that? Is it that you go, wow, I found an amazing counselor and we did monthly sessions. Is it, I went to onsite and I did work there on a personal level for a three day retreat. Like right. who's on the Julie team as you start to go, whoa, like I'm about to meet me possibly for the first time. Yeah. Who, who's helping in, in that, in like that interaction? Yeah. So therapy for sure. Um, you know, just a a therapist one-on-one. Um, I also got into a 12 step program called Al-Anon, which Mm -hmm. is for anyone who has ever been affected by alcoholism or they have a loved one that is affected by alcoholism. So it's kind of like the, the AA for the non-alcoholics, but the ones that are still feeling the repercussions of that. There was a lot of that also in my origin story and my upbringing Mm -hmm. as well. And that allowed me to really what they say in Al-Anon is like, you know, um, drinking to an alcoholic is thinking to an al So it really mm-hmm. al- allowed me to start to disrupt a lot of the patterns that I had in my thinking. Um, for example, you know, my control issues, um, my codependency, my people pleasing, my mm-hmm. desperate need for validation and worthiness, um, my staunchness to have to achieve. Um, I'm also of the mindset that it's never going to be enough. You know, one time I had a friend ask me, you know, how much money would I need to make in a year for it to be enough? And I literally looked at her like a deer in headlights because I, yeah. I was like, I, I don't know. What kind of question is that? What kind of question yeah. is that? Like all, like how much money? All the money. I need all yeah, the yeah, money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're going to have to print new money. Right. Like bigger bills. Right. And so it, it was just never enough. And so yeah. I had to, you know, th- that 12 step program really helped me identify a lot of those, those thoughts and behaviors and patterns. Therapy really helped me identify that. Yeah. I, I love to read. So, you know, I would read books like The Big Leap. I mean, anything that I could get my hands on that was personal development, that was self-help, really also helped. And then I think for me, too, it was allowing myself to just have those moments of of being in in the uncomfortable. You know, I always I'm like. God, give me the awareness and give it to me fast. Like, let's get, let's get a solution. Yeah. Like the show on the road. Let's go. I, I don't yeah. have time, you know? And okay. so I think that kind of sitting in the muckiness of that, it, it, yeah. it, it forced me to have the time to really start to face some of that. So that's, that's a, that's an amazing answer. I, I love hearing you process it. I think there's a ton of people that, especially coming out of the last two years, are processing things they didn't know they needed to process. Mm-hmm. Um, so that there's tangible steps, I think, is is always, always helpful. When you think about influence and helping people build influence, what are the biggest challenges they run to, run into? Is it that mindset of who am I to share these ideas? Because sometimes I'll, I'll meet would-be authors because I write books and they'll say, 
the book I want to write's already been written. And I always say like, it hasn't, um, mm. the, you know, it hasn't been written in your voice. Um, but what, what do you think stands between people who have a message to share or they have, you know, you're, you're standing in front of a light that says shine. They have something to shine, but they don't think they can. Yeah. So it is this idea of, well, first, even with that word with influence, it can have a very negative connotation for mm. people. And so first I have to, since I've really, I've built whole brand and platform on the idea of, you know, we all are essentially influencers. We all have a message that we want to share with the world, especially if you're someone that's listening to a podcast like this. (laughs) I'll say to people a lot, you know, your influence is your superpower, whether or not you realize it or not. And so I think that it's first unlocking the lack of realization, which is really just the lack in what's possible. A lot of times I have found that women especially will come into situations or experiences with very limiting possibilities as to what is possible. I see it with negotiating a lot. We will always ask for less because we don't want to be told no, or we will always, well, this is what I really want, but if I got this, I would be happy. So I'll Mm -hmm. just kind of go for that. So it's about first, we kind of limit what our desires and dreams are in the first place. And then the second that we're given the opportunity to believe in what's possible, we're already psyching ourselves out of it. And so that's when people will say, well, who am I to do this? Or I'm not enough Mm -hmm. to do this. Or, ooh, influencers are sleazy and they're slimy and they're salesy. And it's all makeup. I make up mostly. Right. No, they're just selling their thongs and their gummy bear (laughs) hair vitamins. And, you know, or such a range of products you just mentioned. That (laughs) is fantastic. That's the spectrum, folks. You have two options. Two options. You know, or I'm not in sales, which is like, we're always selling something, whether you want to realize it or not, or admit it or not. So I think that it's really about awareness is the first step, really getting Mm -hmm. aware of what it is that you're telling yourself and why. And a big question that I will ask people when they're giving me some kind of limitation or excuse, I'll say, well, what's the payoff? And you thinking that what about your, your childhood or your upbringing or your current family dynamic or your business dynamic? gives you some sort of payoff? Is it that you can remain a victim to your own circumstances? Is it that you don't really have to show up and do the work? Is it that the problem is always you know, out there? Is it that you're waiting for your externals to change, to start stepping into who you want to become and who you want to be? That's a big thing. So did I answer your question on that? I mean, it's kind of layered, but that those are sure. the, the most, the key points that I see most. Yeah, I, I think, the being honest and the aware, I mean, because I'll have authors say, if only one life is changed by this book, it was worth it. And I would say, no, it's not. It's really hard to write books. Like next time, write an email to a friend it takes like half an hour. Mm-hmm. Like be honest about the, the desire should be a hundred thousand people are impacted by this book. Like yeah. you worked really hard on it, but because we want to play it safe and we don't want to get hurt, we go if only one person, because then if only a hundred people were like, oh, okay, but only one, it's just, those fake kind of goals, those like, you don't get real life change with fake goals. Like you just don't. And so when authors say that, they're like, that's not true. Like screw one person. Like it was hard. It's hard. And and that's why I always left John. I don't know if you ever hear Like I'll see someone who like becomes a bestselling author. And the first thing they'll say is like, well, I never thought I would write a book. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Really? Did really? it just happen? Yeah. yeah. It fell on your yeah. lap. But I think that we do that because we feel like we need to humble the dream or we need yeah. to downplay. Like I never thought to be so bold and so expansive and so abundant and so joy filled to be able to say like, I would write a book, but it's like, but you wrote one. So yeah. Clearly- and you knew what you were doing. Like while you were, you probably noticed while right. you're writing, you're right. like, I, I'm putting words on paper right now. Right. This might end up in a chapter. Exactly. Or yeah. you know, some people say, I never thought I would write a book. But, you know, for years I had this folder in my Google Drive that said if I were to ever write a book or I never thought I would write a book. But sometimes I would connect with these agents or these writers and I would start talking to them. And it's that in and of itself is not only denying the power of your purpose, but it's denying the power of other people's purpose. Well, and I I think it also gets into the idea of you can't celebrate or be excited about stuff. Mm -hmm. Like we have a humble brag culture where if you are sad online, people show up, misery loves company and they go, oh, that's the worst. That's the worst. That's the worst. If you say, hey, here's the thing I'm excited about. They go, oh, well, humble brag. Like you can't. So me and my friends, we have what we call a brag table where like you'll declare brag table and get to say the thing you crush. And it's like, I crush this. 
And it was amazing. And it just worked because there's so few celebratory moments where it's okay to be like, Julie's book crushed. Like her business is doing really well. She's helping thousands of women. And there's just not a lot of natural places in the normal world for you to take that victory lap that I think is honest. I think it's dishonest to only say, that's the reason we say we only learn in failure. And speaking of like a place where you can take a victory lap, you're a huge believer in masterminds. Um, There's a whole chapter on it. I would love to hear your thoughts on if somebody said, I've never even heard of a mastermind, like it's my version of your grandma's ocean. Um, Nice callback. Um, And then they say to you, how do I build it? How many people? What does it involve? You know, what should the format be? How would you walk somebody through a mastermind build? Yeah, I mean, well, the way that I understand it, traditionally speaking, a mastermind is a group of masters minding together, meaning they are sharing their thoughts, their perspectives, their wisdom, their experiences with the hope that it gives the other people, you know, a stronger platform and foundation to grow. And it's really about a group, a a collective group of people. You can be from different walks of life, different industries, what have you, but you're kind of at the same level business wise, and you're all wanting to rise the tide and come up together. I think that that word has gotten thrown around and misconstrued, especially in like probably the past five years. A lot of times Mm -hmm. someone will say, oh yeah, I've got a mastermind. They'll start explaining it to me. And I'm like, that's not a mastermind. That's a high level coaching program, but Mm -hmm. that's great. Mm -hmm. So to me, I really feel like it's a collective group of people coming together. Now, hopefully that answers what it is. If it's right for you or not, you know, I think the biggest question that I love to ask people if they're wondering that it's about getting clear on, well, what, what is it that you're looking for? Are you looking to learn from peers? Yes or no. Are you looking to be coached? Are you looking for consulting? Because coaching and consulting are two completely different things. Do you know the difference between those three things and how they could support Mm -hmm. you and not really getting clear on that. And then I think that before someone enters a mastermind, let's say that they've gotten clear on what it is, they know what their Mm -hmm. goals are, they feel it, they feel that it's ready, but they don't know if this is the right one for them. The biggest question I think anyone should ask, and I've just learned this through my own trial and error, is that the the mastermind host, the, the, the person that is creating the container and welcoming these people in, you have to make sure that that person has done themselves successfully what it is that you're trying to do, in my personal opinion. Yeah. You know, if if I want to write a best-selling book, I'm not going to go in a mastermind with someone who's never wrote a best-selling book. If I want to go speak on stages, I'm not going to be a part of a mastermind with someone who's never spoken on the kind of stages that I would want to speak on. Mm-hmm. And whether this is a mastermind or a coaching program or a course or whatever, if people say, hey, I've tried this and it didn't work for me, well, I'll ask him, I said, well, the person that was leading you, have they actually done and not just taught it? but actually Mm -hmm. done what it is that you were wanting to do, yes or no. And so that would be my biggest takeaway from anyone who wants to experience a mastermind if they're kind of toying with the idea, really asking yourself those questions first. I I love that and agree with that a thousand percent because there's a ton of masterminds, coaching, consulting, every form of education is available right now being sold by people who have not done the thing. They're very good at selling the thing, Mm -hmm. but then... There's no, the, it's kind of like every, we live in the South, every fireworks store here is the world's largest fireworks store because they build walls around a trailer. Right. And then you, like, there's no third floor. There's never been an escalator in a fireworks store. Right. So like you're driving and you, some of these courses are like that. We're like, I'll tell you how to sell a New York Times a seller. And you're like, have you done that? And they're like, hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Let's not focus on questions like that. Let me show you my modules. Why don't you do the thing? Or I, I'm going to teach you how to build a big personal brand. Do you have a big personal brand? It's like, whoa, wait. Right. You know, I influence the influencers. So right. I have 10 followers. Right. You're like, okay, that's that seems something's off on that. So I love that you have that that same approach. I think what I liked about the book too is there's a lot of honest stories. There's a lot of vulnerability, but there's also a lot of actionable steps. Mm-hmm. So it's not, you know, just be yourself. Um, you know, our space, the space we're in has a lot of fuzzy advice that, you go, well, what do, what do I do with that on a Tuesday? And I think you really go in and say, okay, here's what a, you know, a pitch looks like. Here's what a negotiation looks like. From your perspective, what do you think is some of the actionable advice people are going to take from this book? Yeah. Um, well, since you talked about pitch, pitching and, act, and actionable advice, we could start there. I have an entire chapter on pitching because I believe that it is so important to 
just our entire lives. We're always pitching. Pitching is selling. We're always selling. Mm -hmm. We're always pitching. I was a publicist for about 10 years before I got into doing what I do now. So back to that point of make sure you're learning from someone who who has done what it is you're Mm -hmm. trying to do. And I still pitch every single day in my life, whether it's pitching podcasts, whether it's pitching, you know, my son on what I want him to eat for dinner, whatever Mm -hmm. it is. Right. Um, So I think when it comes to the actionable steps, really honing in on first understanding the mindset around pitching, getting your mindset right about that, why it's so important in your life. It's like the air we breathe. It's like the weather. We Mm -hmm. can't get away from it. And then really understanding the framework. And I think a lot of times when it comes to taking to taking any kind of action, and we'll use pitching as as an example, people will say it doesn't work for them or, you know, it's not useful because they've tried it once and it didn't work, or, you know, they don't really need that in their lives. And a lot of times what I find, and you may find this too, John, is like with, with anything that we want to do, I believe in having a recipe, you know, I'm not going to go and try to bake a cake or bake, you know, my mom's famous spaghetti. If I don't have the recipe, why? Because I'm probably not going to put the right amount of eggs in the cake. I'm probably not going to put the right amount of flour in the cake. It's probably Mm -hmm. not going to turn out as great as it could. But if I have a formula that works and a recipe that works and that is given to me, then I know that I can knock it out of the park anytime because I can follow a step by step. Mm-hmm. I love a step by step. So with with any kind of action that I propose people to take, I always say go and learn from someone who has done what it is that you're trying to do and make sure that they have a documentation or or a formula in place. I think a lot of times people love to sell the curriculum But to me, those are the bells and whistles. I'm like, sell me my dream come true. Sell me, don't sell me the airplane. Sell me Mm -hmm. the destination. That's so good. Yeah, I love that. Like, let me know where I'm going. And so it's like, I don't, I don't care about, you know, what the bathroom looks like in the back of the airplane. I care about how good that hammock's going to feel on the beach Mm -hmm. once I get to that place. And so you have to remember that whether you're, you're buying into something or you're selling something and the effectiveness of taking action, people buy into processes. And it's about you being able to effectively articulate the value of that dream come true, the value of that result. Mm -hmm. And if you can sell someone their dream come true and really give them the action steps to take it, then everybody wins. So it's like the dream come true is always, you know, I want to get the girl. I want to get the guy. I want to lose the weight. I want to make the money. I want a better relationship with my spouse, whatever that may be. And so for me, it's about those those tactics and really finding a recipe and a formula that works. I love the idea of a recipe. It's so, and I think the book really does a great job of that, of having clear hooks and handles where somebody can go, oh, okay, that she reframed this thing that I was having a hard time understanding. And now I see a handle to carry that into my life with. Um, yeah, I, I love that. I love that approach. I'm curious, how do you spend your day? Like right mm-hmm. now, so we fast forwarded, we started with, okay, it's 30,000 in debt. You did a lot of rebuilding, a lot of soul work. Walk us through like, okay, this is like Juliet or best is spending X amount of time on this. And these are the things I do. These are the things I have other people do. Like there's no such thing as an average week. It's such a weird question. But like, how do you divide your time and where you're putting your creativity? Yeah, that's a great question. So a few years ago, I learned the concept of batching. I can't remember who taught on that concept or whatnot, Mm. but I read about it and it was great because at the time I was building my podcast and I need to figure out how to reframe my day. So I try to really batch, which means I will focus on, you know, similar tasks in a certain amount of time. Um, Those could be within hours or the same days. So when I'm podcasting, I'm pretty much only doing podcasting during that day. I also like to kind of reframe my work week in that um, I have two kids. So my on times are from 10 to three. So if Mm. you want to get me, you have to get me between the hours of 10 to three because my son gets home around four o'clock and I've got to be, you know, go time Yeah, by the time he gets home. And I will start my morning earlier, but I don't actually get on the computer and start consuming the energies Mm -hmm. of other people and the needs of other people until 10 o'clock. So in the morning, and I just started this this year, and I know that you will understand this, I knew that launching a book is a beast. You know, there's 
the writing part of a book, the editing part of the book, and then the marketing part of the book. And you're the marketer. Like you are the, the, the number one person who has the most skin in the game is named Julie. Yes. And, you know, I love marketing. I'm a yeah. marketer in my life in general. Yeah. And, and this is a beast of a process. And so I knew that I was going to have to get present. And I also realized for myself and for a lot of other people in this post-pandemic world, lack of embodiment has been a huge issue for people. We are so tuned out of our bodies and really mm. being present and really embodying our thoughts, our feelings, our emotions, being able to effectively regulate our emotions. So I asked myself, well, how, what is something that is realistic and easy for Julie to try to stay more embodied this year? Cause I'm going to need it because I have this book coming out and it was meditating. Mm. So at the beginning of the year, I bought a meditation map on, or mat on Etsy and I have a Spotify account. So I started to search binaural beats on Spotify. Mm -hmm. I'll put some headphones in and whether it's 10, 15, 20 minutes, I will try to every day sit on that mat and just meditate. I have of course missed days since the beginning sure. of the year to do it. Um, you know, there's a lot of days that I am thinking about anything and everything under the sun, which is the exact opposite of meditating, right. but I'm still sitting on that mat. And so I just try to give myself 10 to 20 minutes every day, preferably in the morning before just life starts getting into my brain mm -hmm. that I can really be present and stay in that embodiment. And when I do it, and when I go easy on myself of not getting it perfect or right, and I can just say I did it and it was what it is today and that's enough, I really allow myself to be more tapped in and tuned in to my thoughts, my feelings, my fears what excites me, you know, all of the things that are going to kind of give me the clarity that I need for the rest of the day. And what I've discovered through this process, and I think a lot of times you may see this too in your community, there's a lot of women in my community that they wait for confidence before they'll take action, which mm -hmm. is clarity, essentially. They're just waiting for this confidence to kind of like fall down from the sky. But clarity actually creates confidence, not the other way around. And mm -hmm. so what that meditating has done and what just allowing myself to be embodied has done is giving me the clarity that I need, which then creates more confidence in my, my day, my abilities, my outlook. So that's been a huge thing for me this year. It's to balance it that way. Yeah, we, we say sometimes uh, bravery is a choice, not a feeling. Mm -hmm. Like it's a choice, not a feeling. And so, and there's a lot of days where you have to choose it a hundred times before you feel it once. And you go, no, we're gonna, it's a choice, not a feeling. And I can't wait for it to show up. And so, yeah, that, that's, that really resonates, I think, with a lot of people um, listening. I'm curious, what if you had to say, here's the books that are on my Mount Rushmore, four books that are on your Mount Rushmore, a book you've given away more than any other book other than your own, what would you put up there? The Four Agreements by mm -hmm. Don Miguel Ruiz is in a phenomenal book. Um, Eat, Pray, Love, Man, that got me through my 20s. Oh, that's good to hear. That's yes, good to hear. That was a Liz Gilbert. She really. Yeah. You and like 19 million other people. Right. That one did very well. Yes. It, very it, well. it allowed me to, I felt like she was in my brain. Like I was yeah. literally nodding the entire time that I read that book. That, that book was incredible. Um, there's a recent book that I read by an author named Tulu Skylar Quinn called What We Wish Were True. Mm -hmm. She it was 40 years old and actually just recently died of geoblastoma. And so it's a book on her death and having to come to terms with dying with two young kids at home. Wow. Beautiful book. Mm. Um, I'm someone that tends to hate grief and avoid it, but I also know that's grief is the flip side coin to joy. Yeah. So um, it's that book, what we wish were true has really allowed me to embrace grief and in this really beautiful way. Um, so those are three. And then I would say a fourth book, more of a business book. I read it's like this big, um, it's thin, but it's like a big book. It's called $100 million offers. Oh yeah. Alex Hormozzi. Alex. Yeah. It, yeah. I just, it was refreshing. And I think for someone, you know, I've been in business for, you know, seven years now on my own and even before in, in corporate and agency life. And I, I love to kind of have those reframing moments and to kind mm -hmm. of poke holes in, in my own process and kind of think like, okay, what's missing here. And, um, he just gave a really clear, again, step-by-step -step actionable take on on offers and I love a good offer so that was a great book yeah that one was interesting and the printing of it the yeah. way like it's massive and like impossible for any shelf 
And mm-hmm. like, it's so, yeah, I have that on my shelf right now. And I thought the same thing. I was like, and it's so clear though, his, all of his communicating, like he's super clear on yeah. Instagram. I mean, he's got it really dialed in. Okay. Only, uh, only two last questions. So you're, you've been married since 2013. Yeah. So phone calls, 2015. Your husband is famous, right? Yeah. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Um, I'm going to mispronounce his last name. Jonathan Sheck. Shrek. Shrek. It's like Shrek um, without the R. Exactly. I think a lot of people know him as maybe the bad guy in that thing you do. Yes. Um, I don't know. Is that what he's most known for? He is, yeah. He's notoriously known for playing the brooding artist Jimmy in that yeah. thing you do. I mean, he is, he's been an actor since 1990. He has starred in over 40 films. But that is just, that is such an iconic classic for so many people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So here's my question. What's it like having two creative artistic people in the same house that, that have public personas? Yeah. You know, it's, I think it helps that we're not in the same industry. My husband was Ah. actually married to an actress before me and obviously they're not married anymore. So I think that the dynamic of that could be harder. Mm -hmm. And a lot of positives it lends to, he really understands the creative process. He understands the Mm -hmm. entrepreneurial mindset, the visionary mindset. And so he Mm -hmm. is my biggest champion and fan. And in turn, I also understand the process that he needs to take of creating and how sometimes we need a lot of isolation in order to really create and get that get that work out to life. So I can also give him that space. I tend to work best in isolation. So we we complement each other and, and we can um we I think because of what we being creatives, we we have learned not to take it personally when each other really needs their space and their time. Where it can come to conflict is just we're both two passionate visionaries who have a lot of ideas and want to do a lot of things, and the yep. amount of ideas are never gonna stop. So it's that balance of being a parent, being partners, being married, and then also being two powerfully creative people and how do we balance that so that's a different yeah, I, process <laughs> yeah I was gonna say that's an interesting and that was fascinating to me because my wife and I are the opposite that way like she wants nothing to do like events ask us to speak together sometimes and she's like you can't afford me there's no amount of money that will get me on that stage with my husband and so anytime that I do bring her into something it's like the audience loves it. It's such a fun thing, but she's definitely, so I was curious about how you guys handle that. Last question. This one's a super, this is a softball as, as they all are. Where can people find out more about you? Tell us, buy the book, listen to the podcast, like give us all this stuff. Yes. Yes. So you can buy the book, get what you want, wherever books are sold. You can also listen to the book on audible. I know my husband is severely dyslexic and does not read a thing. So if you're like him, you don't Uh, have to be dyslexic, but if you love to listen to books, you can get this on audible. I just recorded that a few weeks ago. It was a blast. The book comes out on June 7th. It starts to ship this month in May. So um, by the time you're listening to this podcast episode, it will be out and available for you. And as you said, pretty much each, almost every single chapter has an actionable takeaway at the end of it. So if you're someone who loves to kind of brainstorm, deep dive, have that space to journal out, you're going to get those at the end of each chapter. And then you can hear me kind of blabbing about uh, all things branding, influence, and personal development over on the Influencer Podcast. We recently had our five-year anniversary, so it has been going strong for half a decade, which is insane and amazing. That's a thousand years in podcast terms. It really is. That is a long time. Yeah. And I have been showing up every Wednesday for the last five years on that podcast. So I love it. I love the podcast. I love our community there. And then my website is juliesolomon.net, wherever, if you want to learn any more about what I do, how I do it, who I help, you can go over there for that. And then I tend to hang out the most on Instagram. And my Instagram handle is at Jules, J-U-L-S, Solomon, S-O-L-O-M-O-N. Perfect. That was very succinct, but there was a lot of information in that. Yeah, you've done that before. It's almost like you're good at pitching stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, then imagine that. <laughs> imagine that. Well, Julie, this has been a blast. Um, it's so fun to know you're in Nashville too. We've got a bunch of mutual friends. Um, before we got on talking about we both know and love Lewis Howes and AJ and Rory. And I'm sure that if we spent 10 more minutes, we'd have 100 more people because it's a small circle. It's a small city. Um, so welcome back to um, to Nashville. I know it's not super new, but it's always fun that when creative people return to the city that does so much creatively. Mm. So thank you so much for joining me. And I hope a bunch of people run out and get your book, get what you want. Thank you. Thank you for listening to my interview today with Julie. We'll put all the links in the show notes as always. And thank you 
for reviewing my podcast. The reviews you guys write are super encouraging and super helpful. I've said this a thousand times. Podcasts are weird because there's not a ton of direct interaction. It's not like a speech where you can see people in the crowd. You can tell like, oh, that joke is doing this or that that thought is doing this. And so the reviews become really, really important because it's my chance to get some feedback from you guys. So thank you so much for doing that. Please make sure you subscribe or follow or whatever it is the kids are saying these days. And please write a review. See you next week. And remember, all it takes is a goal. Thanks for listening. To learn more about the All It Takes is a Goal podcast and to get access to today's show notes and exclusive content from John Acuff, visit acuff.me slash podcast. Thanks again for joining us. Be sure to tune in next week for another episode of the All It Takes is a Goal podcast.